In this post, I describe the science behind the Barrett Universal 2 formula. I have frequently caused, got questions on Barrett Universal 2 formula, and I thought that I uh, would put my thoughts in the slides before you. However, my understanding of the Barrett Universal formula is not complete, and I seek to understand more about this formula. But whatever is available on the public domain, I try to assimilate it and I'm trying to explain it in a simple and lucid way. Friends, uh, the original work of Barrett was actually first published in the JCRS in 1987. And that forms actually the backbone of what we know today as the Barrett Universal 2 formula. So that was actually published in 1987 at the JCRS. So what we understand as new age formula, right? Some describe this as the fifth generation formula. Some, some say it's as next generation formulas. So the genesis of this formula was actually, you know, it lies in the works published by Barrett in 1987. Now, Barrett is actually a theoretical formula. We all understand that formulas could be regression-based formulas and it could be theoretical formulas. For example, if you go back to the first generation theoretical formulas, the Fyodorov, the Kolabander, um, you know, these were all being cost, these were all theoretical formulas. So Barrett was also published as a theoretical formula. So Barrett, uh, you know, the theoretical formula applies Gaussian optics in this formula. And sometime in the course of this presentation, uh, I will touch upon the Gaussian optics, right? So in this formula that was published in 1987, way back in 1987, you had to actually enter the IUL thickness, the refractive index, and all details. However, those details are today not readily found, right? You, you, when, you, when you implant an intraocular lenses, you may be knowing it's refractive index, but very few manufacturers spell out the IUL thickness and all those details in that for, in, of that IUL. So this formula was again re-modified in a pub paper published in 1991, wherein Barrett simplified the formula more. So uh, Barrett was the first formula actually, and it still now is the only formula to the best of my knowledge, which involves the principal planes of refraction. And that's a typical physics term. Uh, what this means is that Barrett is a thick lens formula. So in physics, there are two types of optics. You know, one is, that is regarded as a thin lens formula, and then the other is regarded as a thick lens formula. Typically, all IUL formulas has been thick lens form, a uh, thin lens formulas. That is, they don't, uh, they regard the IUL as so thin that the entire refraction in the IUL, in that thin optic IUL, happens only in one plane. Barrett, however, is a thick lens formula, as I said because it understands that in that IUL, right from a 34 diopter IUL to a 6 diopter IUL or a meniscus shaped IUL, there will be two principal planes of refraction. The first principal plane of refraction and a second secondary principal plane of refraction or a second principal plane of refraction. So that basically uh, is the hallmark of the Barrett formula. However, in the paper that was published in 1991, Barrett simplified it, and the formula takes into account now only the second principal plane of refraction. What is second principal plane of refraction? I will explain in the next slide. But before I go to that, what I wanted to make a big, brief explanation of what this uh, image shows us. It shows that the second principal plane of refraction does not change much 
with the change in lens styles. Even if you go from a biconvex lens to a plano convex lens or a convex plano lens, the principal plane of the refraction doesn't change much. What this means is that in ophthalmology is that when you go from one company lens to another company lens, the principal plane of refraction, that is the second principal plane of refraction, I should say rather, does not change much. Now, why is the principal plane, the second principal plane of refraction important here? Is because like the SRKT walks on the A constant, right? You know, the A constant is associated with the SRKT. Uh, the um, ACD is associated with the uh, Hoffer cube formula. The surgeon factor is associated with the holiday one formula. The Barrett also involves the lens factor, which is its constant, the lens factor. And the lens factor, if you have used the Barrett formula, you will know that the lens factor is basically the distance from the iris plane to the second principal plane of refraction. That's basically the lens factor. That's basically the constant. It is like the A constant of the Barrett formula. It tries to understand the IUL that you are placing in the eye how far is the second principal plane of refraction of that IUL far away from the iris plane? So lens factor is the distance from the iris plane to the second principal plane of the IUL. Now you can understand why the principal plane of refractions are so important and that Barrett is a thick lens formula. So friends, I uh, have been talking about the principal planes of refraction. But what is actually this principal plane of refraction? Well, and I will only talk about the secondary principal plane of refraction because that is what is considered by Barrett in its universal two formula. So if we know that the incident rays of light are getting refracted and coming to the focal point, right? If you draw the rays of light backward, right? then it actually meets the incident ray, right? Where it is meeting the incident ray, so you will have a series of incident rays over here, right? Right from the parietal rays to the periphery. So you have a series of rays of light. And if you can draw back those refractive rays, each incident ray will be refracted. So if you can draw back those refractive rays backwards, then you get the principal plane of refraction. Now, the, now, to understand the principal planes of refraction, it is very important because we need to understand the optical properties of the lens, right? It is very important to understand the focal length of the IUL. It is important to understand the IUL power, right? Because the IUL power is a combination of, of factors like the refractive index, the radius of curvature, and the Snell's law. So this is what we understand as the principal plane of refraction and the distance from the iris plane to this secondary principal plane of refraction is the lens factor. So those of you who have already worked with the Barrett formula will know that you have to enter the lens factor, right? And how do you get the lens factor? The lens factor is derived if you have the A constant of the IUL you are using. And uh, if you can go to the APACRS website and you can work on that formula, Barrett Universal 2 formula, put the, A constant, put the A constant of the formula and you will get the lens factor after you have put all the patient details. Uh, the lens factor was also described in a paper in 1991 uh, for a 23.5 millimeter of HGL length and 43.8 diopters of keratometer reading, the lens factor is what you can see over here. Um, I will try to bring out my pointers. And um, yeah, so this is basically the lens factor for an average HGL length for an average keratometer reading. Lens factor is the formula over here. But this is quite rough. Uh, the best way is to go to the APS series website and put the constant of the lens in the Barrett formula and you'll get the lens factor and that you can fit in to 
you know, if you're using the optical biometry machines. So you can well understand, friends, that the lens factor, you know, helps us to understand the effective lens position of the IUL because biometry is not about calculating the IUL power only. It is also understanding where the postoperatively the IUL is going to sit. And in this case, in the Barrett formula, where is the second principal plane of the refraction be placed? How far will it sit from the iris plane, right? And, you know, uh, how far is it going to sit from the cornea also? So that basically, you know, is important. The lens factor, determining the lens factor is important. So we, how do we get the lens factor? We get the lens factor from the A constant of the IUL that is being used. We also get the lens factor from a combination of factors like the patient's anatomical features like the axial length, the keratometry reading, the optical anterior chamber depth, the lens thickness, and the horizontal white to white. So they all are taken uh, into consideration along with the A constant to determine the lens factor. The other important thing that you need to, uh, that is also considered over here, that also is important to determine the lens factor is how far, and let me bring out the pointer. Uh, so how, so the Barrett formula actually divides the entire eye globe into two spheres. One is the anterior sphere, and the other is the posterior sphere or the globe sphere. The interaction, when you put the actual length, the K readings, the ACD, all this data, the IUL, the constant, A constant of the IUL, when you put in all this data, it will, it will then actually determine how these two spheres, the anterior sphere and the posterior sphere, interacting between each other. And that helps determine the ciliary root or the, you know, the, uh, the iris root or the ciliary diameter. So that basically helps to understand the lens factor or how far the postoperative ELP is going to be. The other thing that it also helps to understand this construction of these two spheres, the anterior sphere and the posterior sphere, and the anatomical features of the patient they all also helps to understand the posterior curvature of the lens. Because when you input again the axial length, the K readings, the ACD, the lens thickness, and the white to white, then the anterior segment and the posterior segment spheres are in going to interact and help understand the ciliary diameter. And then again, Another, you know, uh, another circle or a sphere is drawn up to the posterior cornea to help understand the posterior corneal diameter. So, friends, why is the posterior um, understanding the posterior corneal diameter important? The understanding the posterior corneal diameter is important here because from the work of Douglas Cock, which was published in 2011 at the JCRS, we came to understand that the posterior cornea has some amount of astigmatism, which may negate or add to the anterior corneal astigmatism, depending upon whether the anterior corneal astigmatism is with the rule or against the rule, right? So the Barrett formula understands that the corneal diameter you know, it's always higher or always greater at the horizontal meridian than the vertical meridian. As a result, the anterior, uh, you know, the vertically, it has a steeper cornea, right? And that is what also is reflected in the posterior cornea. And since posterior cornea is a meniscus in shape, the net result is that in the posterior cornea, you have you know, approximately around 0.3 to 0.5 diopter of astigmatism in the posterior cornea. That is what the Barrett formula also recognizes. And in the previous slide, I explained to you how the Barrett understands the posterior corneal diameter by dividing the entire globe into two spheres. Remember that understanding the ciliary roots, sorry, the ciliary diameters or the iris root, and then drawing another uh, sphere trying to understand the posterior corneal diameter. 
So again, I repeat that, you know, the two spheres, the corneal and the posterior segment sphere intersecting with each other here, you know, helps determine the horizontal and the vertical diameter of the cornea, right? And that helps understand the posterior corneal astigmatism. So now the question is, we understand the radius of curvature of the posterior cornea, and we have also got the anterior corneal curvature from the keratometer, right? So how can we use this information now to obtain the total power of the cornea? And here comes the importance of the Gaussian optics in the Barrett formula. You may have heard about that Barrett is a theoretical formula. It employs the, it involves the Gaussian optics. And this is what his Gaussian optics formula is, which is D12, which is the net corneal power is equal to D1 plus D2. That is the anterior corneal curvature plus the posterior corneal curvature minus the thickness into D1 into D2. Right? So that's basically the Gaussian optics. And you can break the anterior corneal curvature into the refractive index of the anterior cornea minus the refractive index of the air divided by the radius of curvature of the anterior cornea. Where do you get this from? From your keratometer, the radius of the, the R1 or the radius of the, uh, uh, you know, the anterior cornea. D2 is, is now we are trying to understand the power of the posterior cornea. We know the radius of curvature of the cornea, posterior cornea. We described that in the previous slides. So D2 or the, or the power of the posterior cornea would be 1.336 minus 1.376. So 1.336 is the uh, refractive index of the aqueous minus the refractive index of the cornea divided by the posterior radius of curvature of the cornea, which I described in the previous slides. And then when you understand the, you've got the power of the cornea, you know, you have got the axial length, uh, you have got the lens factor all. Um, it's not difficult for Barrett to understand what would be the ideal power. And it employs the virgins formula, which is described over here, right? So power is equal to N1, which is the refractive index of the aqueous, divided by V, which is the image virgins, minus N1 again, which is the uh, refractive index of the aqueous, divided by U, which is again the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, which is basically the object virgins here. So that's basically the Barrett's theoretical virgins formula. Of course, it is not as simple as that. It, when you break this into, it goes into, um, uh, a good amount of mathematics in it, right? So friends, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I could explain the Barrett Universal 2 formula. I have got questions um, on Barrett Universal 2 formula, um, you know, and uh, I thought to put in my thoughts in the slides. Thank you very much for your patient uh, patience and active listening. Listening, and um, if you want to follow for uh, you can follow my site quickguide.org for more interesting subjects on ophthalmology.